All righty, we're going to do case number one. We're at Cockerel Dermatopathology. It's on January 12, 2021, and it's 9 a.m., 9.10. First case that was part of the unknowns is this um, shave biopsy, and you'll see multiple pieces on the original biopsy. So we have a very good sampling here. We have a very large lesion. As you can see from the shave, every part of this is part of the lesion which is really so shocking because if you add up each of these strips and you lay them end on end, this is probably over a centimeter in size, this lesion. Um, and this was on a very young person. You can see that because there's not much solar elastosis. Um, and as we look at this, you'll see there is some acanthosis. There's some papillomatosis, hyperkeratosis. There's not much inflammation. There's minimal inflammation here. And when we go on higher power, we don't notice anything in the stratum corneum, specifically any yeast. We'll also notice some basal hyperpigmentation here in this biopsy. Um, on some of the other areas, we'll see some sebaceous uh, glands, some rudimentary um, adnexal structures. They're rudimentary as we don't see the hairs coming out of these. And one of the things on the differential that we think about is aneva sebaceous. But if you notice, there's not that many sebaceous glands. Most of it, most of the lesion is this process that's mostly epidermal. So um, this was a very young person and the clinical information that they provided, they wanted an epidermal nevus. And this fit very beautifully for, for an epidermal nevus. It was large. Um, and we have every area of this specimen taken up by this lesion. We don't see any horn cysts, and the acanthosis is um, mild, mild to moderate in these areas. Some of the things that are in the differential is ilvin. With ilvin, you'll see more um, orthokeratosis, you'll see some parakeratosis, and the so called uh, pigeon nest areas where you'll see hypergranulosis and a cup-shaped depression and more of a psoriasiform hyperplasia. So this really didn't fit for ilvin very well. Sometimes acanthosis nigricans can be hard to tell, but typically we do see those in children, but typically you'll see that more often in adults and you'll see more solar damage and that'll be the clue that this could be acanthos nigricans. Carp can be very difficult to tell, especially a carp that doesn't have any pterosperum from acanthosis nigricans. Some other things on the differential, ichthyosis hystrix was, is much, a much larger lesion, more disfiguring, and typically you'll get a clinical history of that. Nevis ver, uh, verusicosis will be more wart-like, so you'll see more wart-like structures, more papillomatosis. Um, so those are some of the things in the differential. Um, obviously, if, if it's an epidermal nevus syndrome, the, the um, lesions will be greater than two centimeters, usually in length. Um, and you'll see other complications such as neurologic, ocular, and skeletal abnormalities. So you can have many, many different patterns in epidermal nevi. You can have hyperkeratosis, papillomatosis, an increase in the granular layer. And we're seeing somewhat of a slight increase in the granular layer it's not that prominent, but you can see the granular is throughout. Um, also, you'll see the basal hyperpigmentation, which we do have here. So this is more of a common type of epidermal nevus. Um, the acanthosis is present, and you can have a type that's very acanthotic. And you can have a, a type of epidermal nevus that looks like incontinentia pigmentii, like lesion. One important thing, we need to look for epidermolytic hyperkeratosis in these lesions. And if you see that um, epidermolytic hyperkeratosis, I know you've all probably seen cases of that. Um, then you want to think about the patient having a more generalized epidermolytic hyperkeratosis um, in their body. So you might want to think about looking for that when you look at these epidermal nevi. And we studied this closely and we didn't see any areas that had epidermolytic hyperkeratosis. So again, with a nevus sebaceous, I'd like to see more sebaceous lobules. I'd also like to see some um, possible apocrine structures in um, uh, nevus sebaceous. I'd like to see more acanthosis, um, but this can be difficult. Um, clinically, they wanted an epidermal nevus, so you want a good clinical path correlation on these entities. Again, another entity, nevus uh, comedonicus, you'll see more cystic structures. So this wouldn't look like that at all because you'll actually see cystic structures um, 
as far as this looking like a seborrheic keratosis, um, typically you see a little bit more pointiness to these ends. Other areas appear more blunt, but you don't have any horn cysts here. And really, do we have an increase in basaloid and squamous cells? Not really. So it's this, this very characteristic sort of flattened tops uh, to these, this papillomatosis that you'll see. Also, this wasn't a young person. Again, you don't see much solar damage. So you definitely want to look for solar elastosis. And being that there's zero here, really none, um, you're thinking about this is more of a young person. And you don't you'll typically see sub, uh, subcares in young people. So this was an epidermal nevus is a beautiful example. We have so many pieces here that you can really study this entity. The next case that I wanted to show you all is this beautiful punch biopsy. This is another case where I got a good strong um, clinical um, information that helped me make the diagnosis. Right away, you notice that there is somewhat of a patchy lichenoid uh, distribution to this inflammation. It is a punch biopsy, and we're seeing that the inflammation is in the superficial dermis perivascularly, a somewhat interstitial inflammation, and there's also a deeper um, aspect to the inflammation. And we need to look at some of these other pieces because it shows it a lot better. Um, in this area here, you're seeing um, some interface change and some exocytosis of the lymphocytes. The inflammation is composed of mostly lymphocytes. There are occasional melanophages. Um, they're scattered, they're not really clumped, and there isn't a terrible amount of uh, melanin in these uh, melanophages. So they're scattered and they're hard to see. Uh, one of the things we'll be doing is making uh, the, the image uh, able to go on much higher power so we can be better describe these cells. So we have an in interface um, dermatitis in these areas, and we also see some exocytosis of these lymphocytes, but the lymphocytes are not tip, uh, atypical in appearance. So we're not thinking about uh, entities like MF, but we do see some spongiosis and this, this forming a little bit of a vesicle here. Um, there is some melanin incontinence. And basically what that means is the melanin comes out of the basal layer and then the melanophages come and pick it up. There isn't much acanthosis here. There's a little bit of hyperkeratosis, but we had a very strong clinical impression that this represented parigopigmentosa. And I felt that it fit very well for this. Um, you know, this patient um, had all of the other characteristics of being in middle age and being um, of Japanese descent. They had some environmental factors and it, the distribution was on the back of the neck and the chest. So, and it was coalescing into this reticulate pattern. So it was very classic. And you may see this entity with the, the ketogenic diets. Some patients are on ketogenic diets and they're not of Japanese descent and they have ketosis and you'll sometimes see parigopigmentosa. So it's so-called keto rash or Nagashini disease. Some people just think, well, this just looks like post-inflammatory hyperpigmentation, but I beg to differ because we have the interface changes and we have exocytosis, especially in this area. And we have some spongiosis. So it fit very well for um, parigo um, pigmentosa. It fit very well for that. So I wanted to show you an example with where there was good clinical correlation. Again, the clinical correlation is very important. I'm just seeing if we left anything out of the discussion. No, pretty much we covered everything there. And you notice it doesn't look like a parigo. You know, it doesn't have uh, psoriasiform hyperplasia. So I think that name is somewhat of a misnomer because you don't see um, acanthosis and you don't see what looks like a parigo psoriasiform hyperplasia here. Next case that we have is case number three. This was a shave biopsy. And one reason that you have to know about this entity is because it can so often be confused with a malignancy and you don't want to overcall things. So we really need to go over this in detail and discuss this entity. Um, we have a shave biopsy. We're noticing right away that if you look at the edges of this, you can see this is definite acanthosis. And we also notice that there's somewhat of a nested appearance to this. And we notice there's a group of cells that seem to be forming these ball-like structures that you're seeing somewhat of an intraepidermal proliferation. And when you go on higher power, you notice that the cells don't vary very much in size and shape. There's not much pleomorphism. 
the NC ratios are not that high. There's plenty of cytoplasm to these cells. You also notice that there's melanin pigment and you notice that these are not nevus uh, cells. These are more uh, squamoid in appearance. They are um, pretty much a clone of squamous cells in these areas. So what this is, is a seborrheic keratosis with the so-called Borstiadesen effect phenomena. And we need to discuss that because we don't want to overcall this as squamous cell carcinoma in situ. Although you can see clonal proliferations in squamous cell carcinoma in situ, but those proliferations are malignant proliferations, not benign ones. So this is a benign clonal pro proliferation. Some people call these seborrheic keratosis clonal type, which um, it does make um, a lot of sense uh, to use that description. Um, some people don't like the, the saying the whole Borstiadesen thing. They find it to be confusing. Um, a hydroacanthoma simplex. Um, you can sometimes see um, the Borstiadesen uh, phenomena in that entity. You can see it in S cases, or as this case, AKs, epidermal nevi, squamous in situ. You can have clonal proliferations, but those are typically malignant clonal pro proliferations, not benign. So the Borst. Yadison phenomena is just a clonal pro proliferation that occurs within an entity. And it was first described in the 20th century by Borst and Yadison. Um, so it's these islands of cells within the epidermis. So again, um, it's just a phenomena. It's a morphologic description. It's not a disease or um, it's not uh, it's not a disease, it's just a phenomena. It's not specific to a certain neoplasm. So that's what's really important to know that it can occur in all these other entities. So this was an SK with a clonal or Borstjadison phenomena. I thought it was a pretty good example, although I have seen it where it's very well defined, but you can see the demarcation here between the regular cells and then this clonal population. So you can see right here the de demarcation. And it's somewhat inflamed, but that's not, um, I mean, that's typical to see inflammation in seborrheic keratoses. And that's why it was taken out. They were trying to rule out squamous in situ. <clears throat> anyway, case number four, I know you probably all um, got this. Um, you have a punch biopsy. Right away, the thing that I noticed uh, right away is that there's a lot of extravasated red blood cells. Right away when I see that, I tend to run around looking for vasculitis. Um, because I, I want to see, you know, is this a, a, a vasculitis? Is this a, a true vasculitis where you see um, fibrinoid change in the walls? Um, the other thing I notice is that, and it's hard to see, and we're going to scan these in a lot better in the future, that there is a ton of eosinophils here and they're interstitially located. Um, also, we notice that there's eos around the vessels and we notice some endothelial swelling around the vessels. And that, that increases the permeability of these vessels. Um, when you see endothelial swelling. Um, and what ends up happening is the neutrophils and the eels can travel outside of the blood vessels and into the interstitium and around the, in a perivascular location. And so you'll see neutrophils in here as well. There's quite a few neutrophils and you'll even see some dust, you know, you'll see some leukocytoplasia. But I usually ratchet up my index for what I call vasculitis when I see a lot of eosinophils because if they want urticaria, I like to see the fibrinoid change before I call it urticarial vasculitis. Um, so, uh, but with this degree of extravasated red blood cells, you know, you start to think about, could this be a palpable, palpable purpura clinically? So um, we definitely looked around very carefully. And I believe in some areas we did see a suggestion of early vasculitis. Um, see if I can find it again you do have areas where the, the vessels are dilated, um, more dilated vessels. So you can see some extravasated reds, you know, with urticaria, but not this many. There seems to be quite a few, and you definitely want to look to see if there's any fibrinoid change around some blood vessels. This could be a blood vessel that's destroyed with some fibrinoid change. So um, with all these EOs, you want to think about the entity urticarial vasculitis. And that's what we thought about here. And um, clinically, they wanted that. Um, some things in the differential are papular urticaria. Again, with papular urticaria, you're gonna see more of a wedge-shaped infiltrate. And you're gonna be think thinking wedge-shaped because the cause of papular urticaria could be due to bug bites. So um, you also want a, a good morphology clinically that they're seeing papules. 
So um, papular urticaria is in the differential. Would I call this a neutrophilic urticaria? Not really, um, because the neutrophils here could be due to the, the uh, true vasculitis. So, um, but sometimes if we see a lot of neutrophils and we don't see vasculitis and we think it's urticaria, we'll just say urticaria with abundant neutrophils. And what is the clinical significance of that? Um, it's very poorly described in the literature. Um, some people think it's, uh, you might wanna uh, have an association there with rheumatic diseases. But what we do in this lab is we'll report it as urticaria with abundant neutrophils and we'll let you decide what the clinical significance of it is. And typically when I see this amount of inflammation and I don't see a vasculitis, I think about urticarial allergic reactions. And I, if I see a lot of EOs, I think about the possibility that a drug could be causing it. So that's another thing in the differential is an urticarial allergic reaction. And there's subtleties with these because it's very hard. You really need good clinical path correlation because we wanna know how long have the lesions been around, what's their duration, and we wanna know what stimulus is causing um, this reaction, how many lesions are they, and what do they look like clinically? So we really need good clinical path correlation because someone will call me up and say, I really think there's a vasculitis here. So we'll do multiple levels and we'll look for fibrin or fibrinoid change in the vessels. So again, this was best placed in the urticarial vasculitis um, area. Um, they wanted it clinically and it all fit very, very well here. The other thing that we need to discuss is the possibility of um, a patient having an, um, if you're a younger patient, if they have Henlock Schoenlein purpura, because as you know, Henlock Schoenlein purpura can um, exhibit histologically features of LCV. Um, it's a subcategory of an IgA vasculitis. So what you'll see um, histologically is just LCV. So if you see a pattern like this, this could fit for Henlock Schoenlein purpura. We don't see much solar damage, and this could be in a child. It could be on their buttocks or their lower extremities. And so we, the differential here also includes a HSP. Again, you know, um, we also want to think about the causes of these entities, infectious drugs, chemicals, cancers, systemic diseases like lupus, and then there's the miscellaneous causes, um, things like bites and atherosclerosis and other things. Um, we're not going to go into the whole etiology of this entity, but this would fit beautifully for Hen Henock Schoenlein purpura because you have so much purpura here, and um, this fits. This could fit for that entity as well. Um, if you don't see that many eosinophils and you're not thinking about an urticalar allergic eruption, um, this could fit for that entity too. Um, it all depends on the number of eos, you know. And again, it's hard to see on this slide um, how many eos there are here. Um, because we don't have a good high magnification of this area. So let's move on to case five. Um, this was a, a neoplasm and it was a very large a neoplasm. When they punched it, it went side to side and, and top to bottom. Um, right away, it looks very scary. You're seeing pigment and right away, you're worried about a melanocytic process. You're seeing some uh, melanin here. And when you go on higher power, you wanna see is the melanin in melanophages or are they, is, is it in dendritic melanocytes? And we're seeing a little bit of both here. When you're seeing these slender long processes, you start to think about dendritic uh, melanocytes. And when you think about dendritic melanocytes, you start to think, could this be a blue nevus? But you always worry about, you know, first is this uh, melanoma. Uh, right away when I think about that, I wanna look at the um, junction and I wanna make sure that there's no MIS atop this lesion. Um, and what we see here is um, there's no MIS atop this lesion, there's no junctional activity. Um, we're also seeing a bunch of pilar muscles here that are just sort of entrapped in this lesion. But again, we're seeing some sclerosis here. We're also seeing an in, uh, increase in cellularity. So there's some aspects of, uh, that are very cellular. Most important thing on these lesions is to go to the bottom of the lesion and to start looking uh, for mitoses. So when you're on a test, you definitely wanna look for mitoses and cytologic atypia. Most important thing for a malignant diagnosis is to look for atypical mitoses. If you see a tripolar mitosis on a test, it's malignant, okay? Just, it's malignant, whatever it is, it's malignant. Um, you don't get tripolar mitoses in benign entities. So uh, if you go down here and you don't see much cytologic atypia, you don't see any mitoses and you don't see any atypical mitoses, 
Um, you need to spend time looking though on a test to determine if this is a benign entity. And that's what we did here. We searched very, very hard and we made sure that we didn't see any mitoses or atypical mitoses in the deep aspect of the specimen. Also too, we didn't notice an infiltrative border. This is somewhat bulging into the subcutis and that's very typical for um, blue nevi. Um, this is somewhat cellular features and it has somewhat sclerotic features in these areas because you're seeing dermal fibrosis. So this was a beautiful example of a blue nevus, um, totally benign. It can look very, very scary clinically. I had someone call me up because they had a very large one on the scalp. We had three slides and 15 sections and I couldn't find one mitosis in all of the 14 sections. I searched like mad and there were no mitoses. So um, it was a totally benign entity. We still QA all of those in this laboratory. We show them to another person. And um, that way we know that, yes, we both looked and there's nothing here that would indicate uh, a malignancy. So this was a blue nevus that had sclerotic features and cellular features. Case number six. Right away, you notice that this is a punch and this is cystic-like structure in the deep dermis. We notice that and, this, and the subcutis. We notice that there's not much going on in the epidermis on this um, lesion. It's down in this uh, cystic-like structure. Right away, we're wondering, could this just be a cyst? But then we notice that there is a foreign material here that's picking up the, um, the hematoxylin and um, it's causing this basophilia. And um, we also notice that there's some areas where they have uh, the um, foreign object has this uh, yellowish appearance, this amorphous yellowish appearance. And typically you see that with um, iron deposits. The other thing we notice is that there's a ton of um, hemosiderin laid macrophages here. Um, again, you have to go on high power and notice that these, these are sort of greenish brown globular structures that look somewhat refractile when you rack down the condenser. Um, and this is hemosiderin, this is not melanin, this is too light brown and greenish. It has a greenish hue and that's what helps me tell hemosiderin from melanin. Also these epithelioid histiocytic like cells are picking up um, this, um, the hemosiderin. And this could be to hemorrhage from the actual trauma of, of this foreign object going into the skin. Um, and, it, and it's also because of the iron in the metal um, from this probably a nail. They probably stepped on a nail or something like that. And you know, a nail that's an alloy and it has iron in it and also has other things in the, uh, the metal, um, other um, impurities and things like that in the metal. So you have this cystic structure. It's not epithelial lined. It's surrounded by histiocytes. A lot of them have hemosiderin. So it's a sort of ferruginization um, in this area. So this again is probably a foreign body reaction to, um, to um, a metal that has some iron in it. Um, and if you look on higher power, you'll see there are some giant cells. There weren't many foreign body type giant cells in here and I'm not really sure why. Usually you'll see a couple, they're scattered and there's a couple here and there. That may be one right there. Um, but mainly you see these large sort of reactive histiocytes that are picking up the hemosiderin. And we could stain it to figure out what these cells are, but it, this is totally benign. It's a foreign body, um, probably um, due to something containing iron. They probably stepped on a metal um, or something, not stepped on because this doesn't look like volar skin, but they might've jammed it into their hand or something or um, their dorsal aspect or their hand, not the, the palmar aspect, because this is not volar skin. But anyway, let's move on to case number seven. Um, right away, we notice we have an ulcerated lesion. And when things ulcerate, they always look a lot worse. So we think, oh, this is just a basal cell next. No way, be careful, watch out. Um, you have to look at everything on high power. And right away, you notice there's a pattern to these basaloid groupings. And you notice there's two cell types. There's the cells in the periphery that looks somewhat darker nuclei. And then the cells in the center that have sort of a paler nucleus, a little bit more open chromatin. And um, also you notice that there is some eosinophilic basement membrane-like material that um, some people say might be type four and type seven collagen around this, um, these basaloid groupings that have somewhat of a jigsaw puzzle appearance. 
So right away you think, uh oh, this is an indexal, a benign indexal neoplasm, uh, not a basal cell. We don't see retraction here. We don't see mitoses. We don't see cystic areas with mucin in them. Um, you know, these areas look very solid. Um, we don't see many mitoses at all, though you can see occasional mitosis. You just don't see that many. Um, there's very few actually. And you see this basement membrane like material surrounding these jigsaw like uh, puzzle uh, basaloid groupings. What is interesting about this case is you have areas that look like a spiroadenoma as well, the so called blue balls in the dermis. And you'll see it right here. You'll have a little blue ball here, and then there's one over here. And um, you want to think about things such as Brooke, uh, Brooke Spiegler, um, and you want to let, uh, you want to alert. Um, the referring provider to the possibility that the patient has this entity so they can look for trichoepitheliomas and look for other things that you see with this uh, Brooks Spiegler um, entity. So um, that's what I wanted you to note here. And when you see ulceration, don't always think malignant. Sometimes people pick at these things and they ulcerate. Um, they're trying to extract them themselves. Um, but this is a totally benign um, entity, but you do want to alert them to the possibility that they have the, the Brooks Beagle. So we usually put that in a note at this laboratory. Um, if it's malignant um, possibility of a malignant cylindromatous uh, process, you'll see bigger islands. Um, the palisade will disappear. The highland sheath will disappear. It'll look more infiltrative. Um, you'll see more mitoses. So, and that's very, very rare to see that. But um, when you're, that's how you pretty much tell the difference between benign and malignant, which is very rare to see a malignant cylindromatous uh, process. But again, all of the things that hold true for malignancy anywhere else in the body hold true here as well. Mm, that's pretty much all I wanted to discuss with you on this. Um, the next case is um, a very quick, fast, easy answer, but if you miss it, um, then you pretty much miss the entire diagnosis. I think a lot of you have already seen that there's a foreign body in this shave. Um, you can see it right here on low power. Your eye should just go right to this area here because you notice that this does not look like regular cell walls. Um, in um, animals, this is plant, this is cellulose, and these are plant cell walls. And when you see cellulose and plant cell walls, you have to think about the possibility, could this be wood? And if this is wood, then it's a splinter. And if it's a splinter, this is a foreign body reaction to a splinter. We are seeing a suppurative inflammation. So this may have caused an infection. There's a lot of neutrophils in here. There's some lymphocytes, there's some histiocytes. Um, one thing you need to look for as well is you need to look for fungus. When you see a splinter um, and it gets jammed into the skin, it can carry along with it um, fungal spores. So you definitely want to look around very carefully. You can use a PAS stain to highlight that and to see if um, there are any fungus, any fungus in this, um, this uh, splinter that's infected. Um, also, too, you can culture it. If you have any thought that maybe there's an infectious process, you can culture it. If you see it traveling up the arm in a sort of sporotrichoid fashion, you can culture it. So keep that in mind when you have a splinter and someone gets a splinter that it can easily get infected. And we're seeing quite a bit of pus here. So there may even be bacteria that were en entered into um, this process because it, as it broke the skin. It almost looks like it's trying to eliminate the splinter because you have this sort of cuffing around here. But anyway, so that's a foreign body to a splinter, a wood splinter. Um, the next case is, um, it looks like it's a neoplastic process. There's a punch biopsy. They look like they got it almost completely out with this one punch, which is very good, very, very nice how they, they got it out with this punch. Um, you notice it's very well circumscribed. So right away, we're favoring a benign process. Um, also on higher power, you notice that there are these uh, epithelioid groupings. There's duct-like structures. There, but there's also this very characteristic myxoid stroma. You also notice there's two cell layers to these duct-like structures. Some of the things in the differential are things like um, 
syringocystadenoma uh, papilliferum, papilliferum, but this was, this was not on the scalp and we don't see the papillary structures. What we're seeing is this myxoid stroma. So, and it's, it's sort of getting a hint that it wants to form uh, cartilage. So this was best considered a chondroid syringoma um, because we have the two components, epithelial and this myxoid component. But for a second, you might want to think about a syringocystadenoma papilliferum. But with this amount of epithelial proliferation and these duct-like structures everywhere, and you don't see good papillary structures, you don't see any plasma cells, you know, this really is best uh, considered a, a mixed tumor or a chondroid syringoma. When you look at this tumor, you always want to look around for nearby salivary gland, especially if you don't know the site because if you see salivary gland, you wanna put it into more of the pleomorphic adenoma category and that's probably arising from a salivary gland. If we find salivary gland and you're near the lip or you're up here near the parotid, we'll let you know if we think that the pleomorphic adenoma is arising from salivary tissue. So when you're on the face, um, think about the possibility that it could be arising from the parotid or they could be arising from a minor salivary gland. So keep that in mind um, in the back of your mind that mixed tumors don't just arise in the skin, they can arise in salivary gland. But this was a chondroid syringoma of skin, a chondroid, a mixed tumor of skin. So, but it didn't have good chondroid areas, but sometimes you, you see that where it doesn't have good chondroid areas. Case number 10. All right, so we have here, we're going along our urticarial theme. And what we have here are many, many eosinophils. We have a superficial and deep perivascular dermatitis with some interstitial eosinophils, a few extravasated red blood cells. We don't see a good vasculitis here. So this is along the lines of urticaria versus an urticarial allergic reaction. Um, we don't see abundant neutrophils, so we don't need to mention that. Um, but when you see an, um, an urticaria allergic eruption, again, you want to look for um, a vasculitis, and we did not see one here. We also see minimal spongiosis because you want to think about the possibility, could this be a contact urticaria or allergic contact dermatitis in general? But we have a much more deep proliferation, and the infiltrate and the eos are going interstitially, and we see some edema as well. And the spongio, there's not much thickening of the epidermis here. So this fit very well for an urticarial allergic uh, reaction. We don't see any uh, leukocytoclasia or fibrinoid deposits in the vessels. Again, these can be very, very hard and you need good clinical path correlation. Um, case number 11, right away we noticed this basaloid um, pr process here and we're thinking, well, what could this be? Is this a tumor? Is this an eccrine tumor? I think you all see this and you're drawn over to this structure. And if you notice, there's mucinous areas and there's serous areas, and you see some duct-like structures and you realize, hey, this is salivary gland. This is a uh, seromucinous gland, probably minor salivary gland. Um, also, you notice next to it, there's inflammation in the cystic structure. We notice that there's a cyst, but there's no true epithelial lining. So um, this isn't a true cyst. This isn't a salivary duct cyst. This is more, um, what we're seeing here is more histiocytes, mucophages, because some of these uh, histiocytes are filled with mucin. So these mucophages, and then you'll see some organization where you'll see fibroblasts and capillary proliferation around this cystic structure. So what happened is one of these ducts uh, grew very, very big, ruptured, and you got extravasated mucin. And then the macrophages came in to clean up the area and you also got fibroblasts and capillary proliferation. So this is an organizing mucosyl. If you want to highlight the mucin, you can use an alcian blue stain or you can use a PAS stain, a diastase resistant, and it'll highlight this area um, containing the mucin. And you have these mucophages. So this was just an organizing mucosyl. If it's under the tongue, it's called a renula. Um, it, you can have it at the buccal mucosa under the tongue arenula. You can also see it uh, near the lip. And this was near the lip, but we don't have attached squamous mucosa to say for sure, oh, this is lip because the squamous epithelium is not seen um, here. But um, 
I can tell you from the clinical description, this was near the lip. So when you're near the lip and you see a blue dome shaped, somewhat translucent um, cystic uh, flocculent structure, think about the possibility of a mucosal. And it can get very solid looking because it organizes. And that's what's happening here. You have an organizing mucosal. If it's under the tongue, again, think about arenula. Um, again, you have the wall is all over here. You have all these cystic structures and the wall is the same. You have histiocytes, fibroblasts, and capillary proliferation, but no true lining. Also, when you're near salivary gland, you better be looking for a mucoepidermoid carcinoma or some other crazy thing that can really hurt you um, as a pathologist if you miss it. So you have to look very carefully. Here, the uh, salivary gland is almost atrophic and you just have these atrophic ducts left. But when you see ducts like this infiltrating, you better be thinking about the possibility of something like a mucoepidermic carcinoma. So you have to be very, very careful when you get into these areas um, to make sure there's not a malignancy lurking around in here. But here it's just a trophic salivary gland. It still has its lobular structure. And then the ducts are all that's left and the ACE and I have been wiped out. Um, and overtaken by the mucifages that have infiltrated in here. So these are just mucifages in here. All right, so, but always be looking for cancer. That's why you have to look at every part of the slide in every area. You just can't whip through these and um, not look at every piece on the slide. You gotta really look carefully um, unless, you know, you're some kind of genius that can look at it. Because there's a lot of sections here and you wanna make sure you don't miss anything. So again, this is an organizing mucosal and it was near the lip. Case number 12 um, is our last case. The most striking feature is a punch bi it's a punch biopsy and right away we notice it's an inflammatory process, not a neoplastic process. Although we have this uh, anexal structure here that does have some inflammation around it. I think this cyst is somewhat artifactual there, but the main change is up here near the um, dermoepidermal junction. We're seeing um, a lichenoid infiltrate mostly lichenoid. It's somewhat, in areas, there is a little perivascular inflammation, but if you look at the overall pattern, it's lichenoid. Um, if you have to make a decision, it's lichenoid and there's tons of melanophages. We don't see any dendritic um, processes on here. And the distribution being lichenoid, we don't, and we don't see anything deeper and we don't see the dendritic process. We're not thinking about a blue nevus. We're thinking about an inflammatory process that's lichenoid and somewhat interface we see some basal or vacuolar degeneration and occasional, we see a cytoid body. And this is an excellent clue to the diagnosis, which was um, very much hooked to the clinical. They wanted um, lichen planus uh, pigmentosa and we gave it to them because we have the lichenoid process, we have melanophages and it looks like a post-inflammatory hyperpigmentation, uh, hyper, uh, but we also have interface change and a savat body. So we can say that it looks like a resolving lichen planus also is in the differential diagnosis. Um, but this is what they wanted clinically. So we're going to correlate with what they're looking for um, because that's the most important thing that you can do is correlate with the clinical because it's very clinical. Um, another, some people think that erythema dyschromicum per stands is the same thing and ashy dermatosis is the same thing, but there are some subtle clinical differences. And, um, you know, you can be a lumper if you want, but you can also be a splitter. And, you know, there are some, some differences, you know, um, some people say there's lichen planus alongside um, some of these lesions. So, um, you know, this lesion is typically more on the trunk area. Um, some people call it the macular variant of lichen planus. Um, I don't really like that too much. I'd rather just, you know, talk about the, the pigmentosis because that way, you know, there's a melanosis going on and what you're seeing clinically, it correlates a lot better. Um, that was pretty much the last slide. So that pretty much ends our 12 slide session. If you have any questions, write me at vray at dermpath.com. Um, I can answer you right away on any questions you may have. And um, thanks for coming and thanks for reviewing the unknowns with me today. And again, we're signing off from Cockrell Dermatopathology in Dallas, Texas. Bye.